Hello, 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 happy crafters. Today I wanted to share 10 different DIY decor projects that you can do at home on your own with things that you find at the Dollar Tree. Yep, you can make your own high-end decor pieces with different materials from the Dollar Tree. So let's get started. It all just goes away. The things I plan to say. Oh baby. So I'm going to start with these two lovely examples or pieces for our project. And I think let's start with the glass paint because this is made for glass. So we're gonna go ahead and use some of this. And I'm pretty sure this is gonna take multiple coats of the paint to cover the glass or plastic. In this case, this is plastic. So I'm gonna go ahead and paint this on. That is the plastic piece, and now I'm gonna paint this glass jar, I guess you would call it, vessel, I don't know. All right, while the glass paint is drying, I think I'm gonna try the watercolor gels on this vase or bottle, which might be a little challenging because that is a bigger piece. I don't know, <laughs> we'll see what happens with the watercolor, what this does. And it says it's semi-transparent. So that paint actually goes a long way too. I'm gonna let that one dry too and let's do, this one would be kind of neat. It definitely goes on really smooth when you do it like that. But I'm curious if I use the glass paint and water it down a bit, if I can get that same appearance on the glassware with the aqua color paint. So I'm gonna add some water, see what happens when I thin it out a bit. Is it gonna work? I have no idea, but we're gonna find out. That is the look I was going for. It looks aged, it definitely has some texture to it. And I was able to achieve this look just with the paint and a little bit of this, believe it or not. I don't know if you've ever heard of powdered salt before, but this stuff is pretty cool for working with crafts. And it's literally salt that is powdered. So it still has a little bit of grit to it, but not like regular salt. And I think you could probably use Epsom salt for this too, but I am gonna show you how I did this with this powdered salt. So I'm gonna start with this vase. Again, it has a couple of coats of this watercolor gels paint, but it's still kind of translucent and that is what this is supposed to be like. So what I'm gonna do is take some of this paint and some of this powdered salt and mix it into a cup. And then I'm going to apply that onto here. So I want this paint to be pretty thin. 
So I'm gonna, just gonna add some salt and a little bit of this paint. And I'm thinking you could probably do this with like regular acrylic paint too, but this was the color that I chose, so I'm gonna use it. So once I have the salt and the paint in just an old cup that I use for crafts, I'm gonna blend that together. And then I'm just gonna add a little bit of water. And I don't know if you can see the consistency. Let's lift my camera up a little bit so you can see, because I really don't want to dump it out. But that is the consistency of the paint, the water, and the salt. So you can actually see the texture of the salt in this while I'm mixing it. All right, so let's see how this is gonna work. inside of that. Yeah, you can see that texture. And that is from that powdered salt, which is pretty cool. All right, so I'm just gonna go ahead and finish the rest of the vases that I did with this paint, salt, and water concoction. Okay, so all of my pieces are dry. I don't know if you can see the texture or not, but there is a lot of texture on these vases from the powdered salt. So now what I'm gonna do is use a little bit of chalk paint, actually more chalk paint than the other color. And for the darker colored ones, I'm actually going to use the watercolor gels. So I'm just gonna use a little bit of this. And now I'm actually gonna use a chip brush and just take a little bit of the paint, so some of the white and some of that aqua color. But I want more of the white than the aqua. And now I'm just gonna dry brush this onto my vase. And this will just add a little bit of lighter coloring to my vase and give it more of an aged and distressed look. And I think that's really what I'm going for when I'm trying to create a kind of a sea glass appearance. I really, I guess I mean I want a distressed look because I want it to look old and I want it to look weathered and worn. And by doing a dry brush technique, that really helps to make it look weathered and worn for sure. And you can add a little bit more paint if you want. You can add less. Completely up to you. It's your project. So it definitely looks aged now, doesn't it? So I'm just gonna repeat that process on my other vases. And I think this one I'm gonna call the bottom of the sea glass because he looks like he's got barnacles and stuff all over him. I kinda like that. All right, so here is my sea glass or faux sea glass. All of my vases are all painted. So all that's left to do is wrap a little bit of jute twine and raffia around like the necks of the bottles, just to give them something a little bit extra. And then these will be done. Okay, so this is what you're gonna need. You need three of these little trays from the Dollar Tree. And yeah, they're $1.25, but you know what? It's worth it. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is remove the stickers from the bottom. And thankfully these actually come off pretty good. I say that, and then this one's a little more challenging, but not too bad. All right, so here are my three little wooden trays. And I got them with the stars on the end, but it doesn't really matter. They have stars, hearts, but whatever the design, it doesn't really matter because you're not really gonna see them. So first I'm gonna connect these little trays together and I'm gonna do two, just like that. And then I'm going to connect the third one to the other end, just like that. 
And this is gonna be the base of the centerpiece. Now, one extra thing that I'm doing, as you can see, is I'm adding some glue to the seams between each of the boxes. And I like this because then it makes it more like it's one solid piece and not three pieces of something put together. So I did it on one side and then I flipped it over and did the same thing on the other side. So I just used some hot glue and then this little tool which fills in that gap. And you can do the bottom if you want, but no one's really gonna see that, so it's not really necessary. And the next part, pretty easy. We are just going to paint these boxes. Now, these boxes are going to be the tray or the base for our centerpiece. And I'm using burnt umber. I love burnt umber. It kind of goes with everything. And I'm just painting one side and basically doing the outside of the boxes first. And I'm just taking a little bit of time and making sure that all of the sides that could potentially be visible are covered with the paint. And again, this is just burnt umber. I'm not gonna add any other colors quite yet. Now, once my box is all painted, I'm gonna go ahead and coat it one more time with the burnt umber. And with the second coat of the paint, you can see that those seams that I covered up, they're not near as visible as they were. So one good coat of burnt umber, and I want this kind of thick because this is where I'm going to start adding in some different paint colors. So I find that it works best for me if the paint is pretty thick and it's got a good base that we can blend all of the colors together. So then I'm just using a tan, I think that's a mocha, and then a cream color. So again, just making sure I have a nice thick coat of that burnt umber paint on the side. And now here's where we're gonna add some dimension. So I'm just adding in that tan mocha color and just basically putting some straight lines and then I'm adding in the cream and then just blending everything together. This gives a little bit more depth and dimension to the paint job, I think. And once I did the sides, then I did the inside of each of the boxes. And you probably don't have to do the bottom, but it's better to not take a chance and just paint everything so that just in case something does show, you won't see any of that bare wood. All right, the paint job is done. So now I'm using some Dollar Tree floral foam and I'm just gonna position these in the middle of each of the boxes and secure them with some hot glue. And these are some really pretty magnolia flowers that I found at Walmart and they were $3.62 per bunch. And I ended up using three bunches of flowers. And first I removed the magnolia heads and then I also removed the leaves because I'm going to be using all of the leaves and all of the flowers for this centerpiece. And then I just started putting in the leaves and I started with the corners and then just worked my way around the centerpiece so that there's a lot of greenery around the edges. And once I had the greenery done, now it was time to put in the flowers. So one bunch of the flowers, I removed the heads and I just secured them with some hot glue into the floral foam. 
And like every project I do, there is no right or wrong way of how to do this. You don't have to use these flowers. You can use different flowers. If you like pink or purple, that's fine. Do whatever you like and whatever is gonna suit your decor best. And I ended up using two flower heads on each piece of the foam. And then on another bunch of the flowers, I cut some of them off because I want them to be a little bit taller and I just stuck them down into the foam. Now I think you could probably get away with just two bunches of these flowers, but I decided that I had three, so I was just gonna put all of the flowers into my centerpiece. But it can be a little bit tricky if you're using lots of flowers. You just have to figure out how to get that secure into the floral foam. And that is pretty much it. And here is our centerpiece, all complete and finished on our dining room table. Now, if you wanted to, you could probably put some beads on the bottom to raise it up, but I kind of like it just like this. What do you think? This was such an easy project and I think it looks really pretty and it really kind of reminds me of spring. All and right, spring. so to make this awesome floral arrangement, I just needed a few things and I had been searching for a square vase like this one, which I found at Something Blue. And next I found these beautiful tulips on Amazon. And finally, some quick water, which is simulated water for silk flowers. And again, I found that on Amazon. So first I wanted to see what the tulips would do in this square planter. And they were a little bit tall, so I decided to trim them down a little bit. And unfortunately, the stems are pretty strong. There is a metal wire inside, so I had to use my handy dandy husky snipping tool. And I got the tulip to the height that I wanted it to be. And I wasn't quite sure if that was the height that I wanted it to be. So I cut another one a little bit taller or longer and I was happy with that. So I decided to make the rest of my tulips match the second one that I cut. And I think it's better to leave it a little bit longer versus cutting it too short because you can always take more off, but you can't put it back on. So laying the tulips side by side, I just snipped off the end, so hopefully they will be roughly about the same height. And like I said in the beginning, I did find these tulips on Amazon and there are links in the description box below in case you are wanting to buy some of these flowers for yourself. All right, so now I have all of my tulips all cut to size. So next I decided how I was going to display these in the container. 
and this is the quick water. This stuff is pretty cool. It's an acrylic and it has two parts and basically you take the two parts and you put them into the container. Now on the packaging, it does say that it works best in a container with a really like small opening, but my goal was to have this in a square container. So we just kind of went with it and followed the directions and hoped for the best. Now, one thing that's really important when you're making this acrylic mixture is you do not want to shake the bottles. If you shake the bottles, it'll put little air bubbles in it, and then that will make your acrylic not look like water. And I was hoping that the acrylic solution would be a little bit firmer, but it wasn't because I wanted to line up the tulips. Unfortunately, that just wasn't going to happen. So I decided to make a bundle of the tulips into the acrylic liquid. And I enlisted my husband's help and he held the flowers as I tied some wire around them and we tried to make them be in the center of the arrangement. And the wire that I wrapped around the tulips, it worked pretty well by using some glue sticks to help keep the tulips in position in the middle of the container. Now this was not the easiest project, but with a little bit of practice and a couple of extra glue sticks, I was able to get the tulips into the center of the glass container. Now this acrylic medium does not dry quickly. It took about a day and a half for it to harden. And even though it was challenging, I was patient and I let it completely harden before I removed the wire. And as you can see, the tulips stayed up on their own in the center of the glass planter. And I wasn't really happy with just having the tulips just like in a bunch like that. So I did take some raffia and I just tied it around like it was a bunch of tulips that I just put into some water into this pretty vase. Now I know they have different acrylic mediums that you can buy that look like water or simulated water. And this one, I believe it was around $23 and it works okay, but I would be interested to test out other acrylic mediums and see how they worked as well. But in the end, I was really happy with my floral arrangement. And here are my super pretty spring tulips so everybody can enjoy them and they will always stay looking like this. Even though this project was a little more challenging, for me, I really enjoyed it and I think it was worth it. I think they look really nice on this tabletop. What do you think? I am really happy that I took the time to do this. And that's what's so fun about doing these DIY projects. If you don't try, you'll never know. Okay, so these are the books that I made or covered that I was inspired to do from something I saw on Pottery Barn. So I had the books already. These are just some books in my collection. In the Pottery Barn one, I believe they have 10 books and I think I ended up with seven or eight. But I was just playing around with the books and trying to come up with a good configuration. So all I had to buy was some fabric and I found this Waverly fabric at Walmart. It was $2.97 for a yard of fabric. And I did buy two of them because I wasn't sure how many yards of fabric I would need. And basically I just covered the books, you know, like we used to do when we were in school with paper bags. Well, I kind of took that knowledge and put it to use for making some book covers for my books. And it really is not hard to cover books with fabric. In fact, what I did was just put the book down and measure off how much is going to go on the inside of the front and the back cover. And then I just cut out the fabric to kind of go along with that. 
And then all I had to do was cover the book and secure the cover onto the book itself. And the way I did this, I can actually still enjoy and read these books. It won't interfere with the page turning for sure, but I like it because all of the books are going to look the same now, just like they do in the Pottery Barn decor, but for a lot less money. And that's it, that's all you have to do. And since I tested out my first book covering experience, I decided to go ahead and cut out all of the material for each of the books before I started to cover them. And the more books that you cover, the better you get at it. So don't worry if your first one isn't quite what you were thinking it would be. With practice, you're gonna get really good. You know how I know this? Yeah, I just covered a bunch of books. And I said And as all of my projects, there is no right or wrong way how to do this. Just keep working at it and practicing and you will get better and better and you will have some very nice covered books just like this when you're finished. So these were the books. This is on my shelf where I wanted them to go, but they were missing something. So I decided to refer back to the picture that I found on Pottery Barn. And here is what they were missing. See that pretty little bow and jute wrapped around it? And do you see the paper wrap colored books from Pottery Barn for $139? Well, I did this for about $6 because I already had everything else. And I'm so happy with how they turned out. I think they look adorable. And you can't even see the titles of the books, no matter what color they were, through the material. So I think this fabric worked really well. And I think the newly covered books add a really nice decorating accent to one of the shelves that I have in the loft area. 
All right, so that was Book Covering 101. I hope you guys really like it. And I'm having a lot of fun being inspired by Pottery Barn. So for this craft, we're going to be using three of these Dollar Tree signs. I think they're like six inches by six inches by six inches by six inches. So six inches around and I've got three of those. And then I have these self-adhesive wall tiles. I have four of them. I'm only gonna need three of them though. So we have the signs and the wall tiles. Those are the major, major components of today's craft. If you're gonna be following along, you're also gonna need some E6000 adhesive, a pair of scissors, and some paint. Depending on what color you want your project to be, I'm gonna be using this white, this is actually chalk paint in a Dollar Tree paint container, and some burnt umber. And I know what you're wondering, what are we making? Well, we are gonna make some, I guess, farmhouse style hangups that we can use in our farmhouse style decorating. And if you're making this project, you are going to need one complete wall tile per every picture. So this is one of our signs and one tile. Now these wall tiles are really cool and they are self-adhesive, but the problem is the self-adhesive part on the back is actually separate than the tile itself. So when we go to make this, it would be really awesome if this would adhere, but it's not going to. That adhesive layer does not stick on its own. Now for this tile, I pretty much, I want the tile, like this center portion, to be a part of my my tile or my picture that I'm making. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut out the tile and it doesn't matter if I get this ink on my picture or even the tile because it's all gonna get painted. And this is going to be what I'm cutting out. Can you see the outline? It's hard to see. So I basically put a pen around the edge and traced it. And now we're going to cut that out of this tile. Then we're going to secure to this sign. So then I'm going to take some E6000 and I'm going to put a little bit of the E6000 onto the sign for the tile to adhere to. You don't have to put a lot. The E6000 works really well and it's really sticky. So then I just put that tile on top of my sign and I'm just kind of moving it around to really get that glue adhered to the tile itself. And that is pretty much it. So now we're gonna let that dry for a little bit and then we'll move on to the next step. All right, so my tiles have had time to set up and to let that E6000 dry. And this is the end result so far. And I'm just gonna use a one inch brush to paint it. I'm going to be using white and burnt umber. The white is actually chalk paint and then I'm going to mix some burnt umber into it. And I'm probably gonna mix quite a bit because I want this to be pretty dark. The chalk paint is nice because it has a different type of a texture or consistency. Oh, getting a little crazy there. Making it so that the paint will adhere really well to the tile. So the chalk paint I find helps a lot to do this. And you can see with these tiles that they have like a raised surface. So I have all of my tiles and they're brown, but I'm thinking I want to change this up and I think I want them to have like a creamy color, kind of a white cream, and then have brown accent. So I am gonna go ahead and repaint these guys. That is the fun thing about doing these projects. If you don't like it, you can you know just wait a little bit and then you can change it. I'm thinking more kind of like a parchment color. So I'm gonna do a little bit of almond. We'll see how that is with the white and if that is gonna be enough. I think so. 
Then I just have to make sure I duplicate that on the other two tiles. Yeah, because I kind of want it, I want to say an antique white, but antique white to me might mean something different than it does to you. Because I'm not thinking antique white like what it is on, say, antique white wall paint. This is a little bit different. But I'm just curious. Just got to try it. See if I'm, I'm wrong in my thinking. Yeah, no, I want that opposite. So I want, I want to do the dark color as my accent to really kind of stand out. And I want the light as the base color. these are dry or mostly dry this guy looks like he's still a little wet and it's been a couple hours so that's okay so now I'm going to make these look more antique -y. so I'm doing opposite of the one I did earlier and I'm gonna use wax because this stuff is fun but I'm just gonna use a little bit you don't need a lot and then I'm just gonna use one of my old chippy brushes don't know even actually why they're called chip brushes but they're definitely fun so now okay moment of truth just go for it Alright, that one is done. That was pretty easy. Now we're going to do it again on this guy. And I guess you would call this a dry brushing technique. Because it's really just picking up the details of the tile. And again, it doesn't have to be perfect. I mean, you can make it perfect, but I think you'll drive yourself crazy if you worry about perfection. It's an original and you created it. So I want to make it look a li little bit old, old timey, I guess. Yeah, I like that. All right, so now all three of my tiles are done. That was super easy. And now I'm just going to go hang them up and we'll see what they look like. All right, so here are my finished tiles. And I actually hung them up in my bedroom along with some pictures <laughs> that I made of barns. And I made these pictures using Bing's AI that create. So I told the AI what I wanted in a picture and it made them for me. If you want some original artwork, you can go on to bing.com slash create and you can actually make your own artwork. It is pretty awesome. And I think that the tiles go along really well with my farmhouse decor in my bedroom. I'm so happy with how they turned out. Hopefully you can see that. We're actually in my bedroom and that's where the tiles are hanging. I found this love sign at the Dollar Tree. They have lots of different framed prints like this. And I really like the size, but I didn't really want to leave that love on there. So using a tool, I scraped off the love and most of it came off, but I did have a few little remnants left, so I just kind of used this little tool and just kind of chiseled away at the glue that was still on there. It doesn't have to be perfectly removed, but the more you can get off of it, the easier it'll make this project. 
So I got rid of as much glue as I could and then just wiped away those little dust particles. And then I picked out some paints that I wanted to make this tray because this is gonna be a tray now, it's not going to be a sign. So I used different shades of brown and of course burnt umber because burnt umber goes with everything when it comes to painting farmhouse style decor. And I have to tell you, if you get a sign like this, be prepared for several coats of paint. As you can see along the top edge, the paint wasn't really sticking very well. So what I did was paint this almost an ivory cream color all over it and then added a little bit of a darker brown. It's kind of a mocha color. And I applied the paint pretty much evenly. And then I set it aside to let that first coat dry. And while that was drying, I took some of these wooden beads and I just painted them as well. So I started off with that cream color and then I added in a little bit of the brown and then eventually some burnt umber. Now I think you can see my contraption for being able to paint the beads without getting paint all over my fingers. It's pretty easy. I just took a wooden skewer and skewered that into a piece of floral foam and then I just painted the beads. And just like the tray, I painted the beads and then I allowed them to dry. And after the first coat of paint had dried on my frame or my tray as it is now, I did add another couple of layers of different colors of paint that were similar. So the cream color, the medium brown, and then of course the burnt umber. And I even added in a little bit of white. I like layering the paints like this while it's wet because it gives a little bit of depth and it just looks really nice, I think. So I just made my way around the outside of the frame with my layering paint technique. And then I did the same thing to the top edge of the tray and then I went around the inside edge of the tray and then added some more paint to the bottom. And I think you can tell, you can't really see those little remnants of the love that was left on from that glue. And there is no right or wrong way to do this. As you can see, I'm just putting on a little bit more burnt umber and then I'm just gonna kind of blend everything in and that will give yet another layer of depth or dimension to my project. And while that was drying, I did another layer of paint on the beads. Now these beads are actually going to be the feet of the tray. So they don't necessarily have to be perfect. In fact, I find if I'm not trying to be perfect, I actually like them better. All right, so here is my tray. It is pretty much dry. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna attach the feet to the bottom. So I just take a bead and put some glue around the edge and then just put it on the corner of the tray. And then I just replicated the process with the three remaining beads. So each corner got a bead, which is now a foot for our tray. And here is the tray all done. All right, so my tray is done. Now I have to add something to it. And then I had this greenery from Hobby Lobby. As you can see, I've already taken a couple of stems off, but I'm just gonna cut two stems because this is gonna be some decoration for the tray. And this greenery was $7.99, but it was on sale for half off. So now I'm just kind of playing around and figuring out how am I going to put these. And then on a thrift store excursion, I found this. It was the vase and it even included these little balls. So not necessarily a dollar, but it was $1.99 for both pieces. So now I'm just kind of putting these little balls and just moving them around to play around and get my decor how I want it to be. And this is the finished project. 
Isn't this adorable? This was so easy and it fills this space nicely and it looks really cool, I think. What do you think? And I like this project so much that I had to make another one because it was so easy. And I also made a gray farmhouse style tray to go on our coffee table in our living room. This is so pretty and it's so easy and it doesn't really look too much like the Dollar Tree, does it? Well, I hope you enjoyed watching this video and I hope I've inspired you to get out and make some crafts for yourself. Today, we're actually gonna be making something using a piece of wood. It is actually a branch from one of the trees in my yard and I really like finding things on the ground and then using them in my crafts. And when I got started with this, it was actually a lot larger and I used my little chop saw that is amazing for crafts like this. You can actually cut down up to two inches in diameter of sticks or wood or whatever you want. And this piece of wood is actually 22 inches long. So if you have a stick that is 22 inches long, perfect. Or if you don't have a stick, you could also use a wooden dowel for this project. And I'm gonna be making a wall hanging using this stick as the main part of the wall hanging, along with some wooden beads and some artificial flowers that I got at Walmart. So this is a eucalyptus one. This is a berry mix. And then this is a boxwood pick. So those are the three greenery pieces that I'm gonna be using for my wall hanging. And then on one of my excursions to the Dollar Tree, I found this wood bead garland. So it's a probably about 20 inches long and I have five of them. So I'm gonna be using these, but that's not gonna be enough beads. So I actually have a bag of beads that I'm going to make a garland with. And to make this garland, I'm gonna start off with some of the string. And I think I actually got this on Amazon. I can't even remember. It's been so long since I got it, but I thought that would be perfect for stringing these beads onto and making some garland. And I don't know if you've ever done this before where you string the beads onto a piece of string, but it can be challenging. Sometimes it goes through pretty easy and other times not so much. But to make this a little bit easier, I actually have these large needles. They're kind of like a crafting needle. And I found these on Amazon and it makes it so much easier to string beads. The eye of the needle itself is really big. So it makes it a little bit easier so you can get that string through there and get it started. which then makes it really easy to string the beads onto the string and make a bead garland. And the Dollar Tree beads are actually really nice, but they are not quite long enough, like the strands themselves, for my project. All right, so I took two strands of the Dollar Tree beads and made a longer strand. And then I took the remaining three strands that I had and made an even larger strand of beads. But I'm gonna need a few more strands of beads. So I have these beads that I got from Amazon. I think I've had them for a while and they're a little bit larger than the Dollar Tree beads, which is okay, because I think this is gonna look really pretty. Now I have laid out my beads how I want them to be for my wall hanging and I'm just adding a few extra of the larger beads to this strand. This is actually one strand of the larger ones but I'm trying to make a pattern of all of the beads and I'm hoping that I have enough of the Dollar Tree beads left to make one more strand of the smaller beads for the wall hanging. Now I have all of my bead strands all done. So now I'm gonna attach them to the stick. And I did tie on that first strand of beads, but I thought, you know what? Let's make this a little bit easier. And instead of tying them on, let's just use a hot glue gun and hot glue 
the bead strands on. It'll be a lot easier to keep these beads where I want them to be if I can put my finger onto it, onto the beads themselves, and then just add a little bit of hot glue to secure that strand in place. I have completed the beaded portion of my wall hanging, so now I'm going to add some greenery. And I found this eucalyptus and I actually like that. So I think I'm going to break this eucalyptus up into pieces and then attach it to my wall hanging. I'm going to place each of these stems on either side of the top of my wall hanging. So I'm just gonna group them all together. And I'm just gonna use some jute twine to wrap around each of these eucalyptus stems. And then I'm gonna duplicate that process with the other seven bunches of eucalyptus. Or seven stems of eucalyptus, I could say. Then I will do that same process of putting hot glue onto the jute twine. And then just use the little finger protector to spread it out so it will stay in place. Then I'm just going to secure this to my wall hanging. Now I wanna make sure that my beads are all kind of flowing and not going to look funky. So I think this guy is actually adhered on a little bit. So I'm gonna do that same thing over here for this other bunch of eucalyptus flowers to be secured to. While my glue is setting up, I have this sedum. This is also artificial flowers from Walmart. I'm going to take off a couple of those branches and add those into because that red or pink is actually really pretty. And now I think I'm going to add a little raffia bow. So I'm just going to secure that into the center using some hot glue, of course. And I'm just kind of moving the raffia around so that it's not just like right in the center. Kind of fan it out a little bit. All right, so for the final part of this, now all I'm gonna do is take some of these little pink flowers and I'm just gonna secure them into the middle of the bow with some hot glue. Using my trusty glue gun. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put the glue on to begin with. And then I can just put these little pieces of the flowers. Again, this is the sedum. So I just took off the like flower part of the silk flower. And I'm just going to put that in the center of the raffia that I used to make a bow. That way my bow looks like it is actually the sedum. That is pretty cool. And there it is, all completed. An adorable beaded garland wall decoration. What did you think? Was this an easy project? I thought this was a super easy project and it is so pretty. I love all of the different layers of beads and the flowers on top I think just really make it something special, definitely original, a very boho slash farmhouse type of decor. Pretty fun project for an afternoon. So this is going to be my planter. I love these oblong planters, isn't it pretty? But I wanted something different than the galvanized and I didn't want it to say that fleurs and jardin. And I happen to have some spackle, so I put on some gloves and then I'm going to spackle this planter. And the reason I like the spackle is because it is going to give some texture to the planter itself. Now, if you're gonna do this, I highly encourage you to use a pair of gloves because spackle is really sticky. So I just worked my way all around the planter, making sure that it was coated with a nice thick coat of the spackle material. And I kind of used like a swirly pattern and just made all kinds of patterns in the spackle itself while I was applying it to the planter. And I wanted to make sure that it was nice and coated, even the top edge, so I just kind of touched that up. And here is the end result. Very, very awesome. And look at all that texture on the planter. And you can't see the lettering either. 
Now the most important part is letting that spackle dry. And what I didn't show you is that I painted it with a cream colored acrylic paint after the spackle had dried. And the spackle is very fragile, even with the paint. So next I took Mod Podge, then yeah, I actually got this at the Dollar Tree too. And I put a thick coat of Mod Podge over every part of the planter that had been painted and spackled. By adding the Mod Podge, it gives a little bit more strength to the fragile nature of the painted spackle, and it will allow me to do the next part with ease. So everything is being painted with a heavy, thick coat of Mod Podge. And I did let it dry for about 24 hours before I came on to the next part of this project, which is dry brushing. Dry brushing is so much fun. And the paint that I'm using to dry brush is the Folk Art White Chalk Paint. It makes an excellent, excellent medium for bringing out some texture and adding some dimension to a project like this. And the paintbrush that I'm using, it's a Dollar Tree paintbrush. So what I did was literally take a plate, put some paint on it, and then just dry brush it. I still want that cream color to show through, so I'm being very, very careful with the dry brushing technique because I just want it to go on the textured surfaces and not the base layer of the planter. And once my dry brushing had dried, then I had to get some floral foam, which came from the Dollar Tree, to put in the bottom of the planter. And this foam fit perfectly. I didn't have to cut it or anything. And next I bought some hydrangeas on Amazon. And actually these are really pretty. It just took a little bit of finger fluffing to fluff them up from their original packaging. And then I just cut the stems to the size that I wanted them to be. And before I commit to any project, I do a little test run and add the floral stems in to see how full this will look. And unfortunately, there was not enough blue hydrangeas. But fortunately, I had two bundles of pink ones that I got at Michael's when they were on sale. So I cut all of the flower stems and actually took off the leaves as well. And then again, testing things out just to make sure I'm going to have enough of the flowers to fill the planter and make it look full so that you can't see any of that floral foam. Yep, I think it's gonna be good. So then I just added in some of the greenery to see what that looked like around the edges. And being very happy with that, then I took the rest of the hydrangea stems and secured them in place. And that is pretty much it. Isn't that pretty? And here we have my adorable little hydrangeas in the really awesome textured planter that I made using a Dollar Tree planter. Now the longest part of this project is waiting for the glue and the paint to dry, but in the end, I think it was worth it. I am really happy with how this turned out. For our next project, we are going to make a vase and I'm going to be using these stickers that I got at the Dollar Tree. And actually that little vase is from the Dollar Tree as well. So I'm just gonna go ahead and apply the stickers in, I don't know, I guess it's kind of a pattern, but I just started playing around and applying the stickers onto the jar, which eventually will be my vase. And I really liked how this pattern was turning out. I think it looks really pretty, but don't worry, we're not gonna leave it like this.
And once I got to the point where I was really happy with the pattern and I didn't want to overdo it, I just wanted a little bit of the jewel accents just in the front of the vase. And then I took it outside and gave it a coat of satin finish white spray paint. And once it was dry, brought it back inside and using some of this really pretty, I guess it's kind of a ribbon, but it's made out of metal. And I found this at the Dollar Tree. I went ahead and attached that around the top portion of the jar. So the vase is pretty much done, but I wanted to add some flowers. So I had these white roses that are silk roses and they actually came from the Dollar Tree, surprise. But what I did was I just took different shades of pink acrylic paint and I just started painting the flowers. I wasn't really sure how this was going to turn out, but actually the more that I did it, the better these ended up looking. And I think you can see on my palette, I have two shades of pink and then a red. So I just kind of blended all of those together to get a really unique look on my roses. And I don't think there's a right or wrong way how to do this. I just dipped the paintbrush into the paint and just randomly added some strokes of color to the silk flowers. And once they were dry, then I put a piece of styrofoam into that little vase and then I secured the flowers in place. I really like the way those flowers turned out. And here are the finished flowers in their beautiful little vase, but look at how pretty they are. Very unique looking, and I've never seen silk flowers like that, have you? And of course, the vase. I really like how this turned out too. guys so this is from the Dollar Tree and it's in the dollar plus section and this is just a wood tray that measures 11 by 14 then I'm going to take some air dry clay and I'm just gonna roll this out and then on that tray I'm going to form this so it makes like a U like a really long U And then I'm gonna repeat the process and do it again. And can you tell what this is going to be? This is going to be a heart. And I really like the way that those pieces are ending up. So I set them off the side to dry. And then I did give a coat of white chalk paint to that little tray. And when that was dried, then I took some spackle and this is like ultra lightweight spackle. And I added that to the back of the tray. And what this is going to do is give it some texture. I want it to look rough and I want it to be a little bit raised, but all going in straight lines, mostly. And once my air dry clay was dry, then I took the pieces and assembled them onto the tray. I did use some hot glue to secure the pieces in place. And then I filled in each section of the air dry clay. And again, I wanted it to have a rough appearance. I wanted to be able to see the different lines in the spackle. And then I repeated the process on the other side of the air dry clay, so the other side of the heart.
and then I allowed it to dry. And once it was dry, then I took some chalk paint that I had mixed a little bit of spackle in because again, I really want it to show some texture. And then I painted everything on the inside with that spackle paste chalk paint combination. I did paint the frame separately with just chalk paint. And this is how it turned out. I think it turned out so pretty. And I was actually inspired to create this when I found something similar on Pottery Barn for $143. I think mine cost about $5. So I'm pretty happy with my results. Well, there you go, 10 different DIY projects. And if you're still watching, thank you so much. I would love it if you would subscribe to my channel. Just click the subscribe button and then click the bell notification so you'll be alerted every time I have a new video. I hope you enjoyed these projects. I really enjoyed making them. Crafting and creating really makes me happy and that's why I really enjoy making these videos. I hope you enjoy watching them and I'll see you in the next video.